What year in a firefighter's life do you think is the most dangerous and where statistically they're most likely to be killed or, or hurt? The first. Not the first. According to what I read, not the first. <laughs> this is interesting. Third year, nope, not from what I, this, uh, this is the tenth, the tenth, that, I mean, you would never guess it, I, w I mean, it, it was just a guess, and the reason is because by that point you think you've seen everything, you tend to be overconfident, and the risk apparently of forgetting to do something that you would never forget or is great. Tonight we're reading about Abraham's tenth year uh, after his call, and he does something really stupid, <laughs> really stupid. And it's like, come on, Abe, you know better than this. And it's like, well, I'm a tenth year of a firefighter's life. It's a, it's a dangerous time. Um, it's in chapter 16, verse 3, is where it says the tenth year. You can see that, but it's just sort of how my mind puts these things together. Let me start with the marsh. Uh, I'm, I'm on the notes here. Uh, and I, I think you know me well enough to know my introductions are going somewhere. I'm not just telling you things that are random. Does anybody remember the marshmallow test, 1960s, Stanford University, a psychologist named uh, somebody that I don't know? But this was, it's famous, and if you, in Psych 101, you're usually introduced to these kind of stories. So the scenario is, there's a four-year-old in a room, and he's told, or she is told by an adult, I'm about to leave, I'll be right back. But on the table, there's a, a plate with one marshmallow. And when I'm gone, you're welcome to eat it. It's okay, but if you don't eat it, when I come back, you can have two marshmallows. Adult leaves the room, and of course there's cameras and people watching the four-year-old. I mean, this is, I love these kind of things, and you know. And uh, some children ate it immediately. Some covered their eyes, you know, <laughs> so they wouldn't see it. Some started singing songs. Some pretended to take a nap, you know, <laughs> trying to. But what they were studying was the uh, effect, the, the relationship between delayed gratification, can I wait and have two, that's delayed gratification, and the relationship between delayed gratification and long-term development. So they took these same kids 12 years later and let me, I'll read you the report. This relates to Abraham, it, uh, I think, I think. <laughs> Those children who had resisted temptation, who did not eat the marshmallow and waited so they could have two, uh, once they were adolescents, were more socially competent. They were better able to cope with the frustrations of life. They were less likely to go to pieces, freeze, or regress under stress, or become rattled and disorganized when pressured. They embraced challenges and pursued them instead of giving up. Most astonishingly, they had a dramatically higher score on their SATs. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah are... God's told them blessings are coming, and they have an opportunity to sort of short-circuit a process with Hagar and uh, eat one marshmallow rather than two. I, I think it fits, but it's, we're talking about faith, and part of what faith is is can I wait for God to fulfill His promise or does he need my help? <laughs> That's a pretty good question. It really is. This is Abraham's, I'm at letter B, fourth test of faith. 
at least the way I'm counting them. And what we're learning is Abraham, the theme of his life is faith. But what we have in the story of Abraham are tests of faith. It's not like Abraham says, okay, I believe, and God says, oh, okay. It's like, no, God says, let's just verify that, and let's just make sure of that. Uh, the first, uh, number one, the first test of faith was when he left Ur of the Chaldees when God's voice called him. Do you remember what grade we gave him on that? We gave him an A. Yeah, you're all scared to answer because you know I set you up for traps. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna gi we'll give him an A on that one. On the second one, when he got to the land of promise, there was famine. The, land, the, the promised land was rather unpromising. <laughs> what do you do when you've left everything to go where God calls you and you get there and it looks more like Death Valley than paradise? What, and Abraham packed his bags and said, I'm going to Egypt. And a lot of bad things happened in Egypt. We're going to give him a F on that one. I'm only, poor fellow, I'm only giving him A's or F's. I don't, I didn't, I'm not, <laughs> this is very unscientific, so, uh, yeah, the this, this pass fail, that's right, it's a, it, these are pass fail. Uh, but you get the point, you can do it differently if you'd prefer. The third test is what we looked at maybe two weeks ago when Lot and he have conflict, there's too many sheep and goats and not enough land, and and then they sp divide up, and then Lot gets, moves to Sodom, and he's taken hostage. Abraham raises an army and goes rescues his rascal of a nephew who's never quite got his act spiritually together. Can I give him an A on that one? It's pretty impressive. He let Lot choose. Lot with his questionable character, Abraham rescues him anyway. It's pretty noble. Okay, we're at number four. This is what we're talking about tonight. We could call the test of Genesis 16. This is where we are tonight. The God is not keeping his promises test. What grade do you think we'll give him? I'm going to give him an F. It's now... This story has a good ending. Abraham's story has a good ending. Mount Moriah, and it just makes me almost weep to even say it. It's like, Lord, what, what are you doing to this poor grandfather? You're beating him to a pulp. I mean, it's, you're just, he believes already, but he's the hero because he's going to Mount Moriah, and the tests get harder the older he gets. It's like, I don't like that very much. <laughs> can't, can't I move to Florida and play shuffleboard or something like that? Faith is far more than mental agreement with certain truths about God, and it is much more dynamic than a one-time prayer inviting Christ into one's life. Faith is a walk. Abraham walked with God. It is a life attitude of confidence that God will do what he's promised. Sweetheart, if God promised his kids, even though you're 85, 75, and I'm 85 in this chapter, let's just hold him responsible. But they don't. They're going to eat the first marshmallow. They say, we better take that marshmallow because there may not be two. It's like... Been there, done that. That's okay. Uh, to verify its authenticity, faith must be tested. And I hope as I'm saying this, you're saying, I think that happened to me. I think that's happening to me. It's like, yes, that's the whole point. That's why we're studying Abraham. His story is our story. Like a muscle being exercised, it grows stronger with repeated use. I like the metaphor of faith as a muscle. It's a... Uh, 
The context of, we're, about, we're about to read it, but let's set it up. The context of Abraham's test. Almost as if a psychologist were setting up a well-prepared experiment. God has arranged the details of Abram, Abram's fourth test. And I'm calling him Abraham. I know he's still Abram, but I'm just because. Number one, uh, he's setting it up this way. First of all, God has made a crystal clear, solemn promise. Now we've seen so far that he's promised him land, but tonight... We're looking at the promise of children. An heir, and we don't know how many is going to be, but through that heir there's going to be stars. You can count the stars or the sand. So it starts with a clear and solemn promise that he will have a son and many descendants. And we saw that last week especially. Can we, let's look at it again just to make sure we get it because this is, this is where he goes astray. What's the promise? Most of the time when I have struggles with faith in my walk, it's because I haven't understood something properly. I thought his promise, and God has basically said, I never promised you that. <laughs> it's like you, you interpreted the promise that way. I, so if we're confused about the promise, that's one sort of problem. Abraham, he knew darn well what the promise was. And here it is. Um, verse 4 in chapter 15, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man, Eliezer, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, number the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed. Okay? So Abraham knows the promise. He's not mistaken about the promise. That's real important to know. Um, Abraham believed God's promise, and God considers his faith righteousness. Okay, the context. Number two part of the context is, Ten years go by. Abraham is now 85. Sarah is 75, plus she's barren. This is an impossible situation. So are you getting the content? I know what God promised me, and I believe him. But for heaven's sake, <laughs> ten years are going by. My wife, we're going to be calling the undertaker here soon. This is... I, what's going on? This is so good. So three, the context is not to worry. A solution is at hand. So many in the ancient Near East <laughs> practiced surrogate parenting. In other words, well, this was not considered immoral in that culture. A wife could designate another woman who would be impregnated by her husband. I mean, just think of the dynamics of this. Yeah. Um, the child would then be adopted by the married couple, and if the father so chose, could become the heir. Surely this must be how God's promise is meant to be fulfilled. And I just added, go ahead, eat the single marshmallow now. <laughs> that sort of makes sense. So this is what's happening. We know what God promised. We believe what God promised. But the clock is ticking. And it ain't going to happen the way we thought it was going to happen. So let's help God out. I'd love to share stories. Okay, letter D. We can diagram the situation like this. Problem. God is not keeping his promises. Solution. We must do something to help him.
Note, this solution is a human invention. This idea of using a servant to bear a child, this is all human ingenuity. There's nothing miraculous about it. There's nothing divine about it. It's just a few people sitting in a room saying, hmm, how are we going to solve this problem? And um, I think of a lot of elder board discussions. Uh, we've got a problem. We're building a building. How are we going to pay for it? Let's find solutions. And there's nothing wicked about what Abraham and Sarah did, but there was God wasn't in it. It was a human answer to a God question. I don't know if that's the way to say it. As the story unfolds, we discover that God has a very different solution. The wisdom of man cannot achieve the purposes of God. The creative genius of the characters in Genesis 16, Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, gave rise to a global, the creative, in other, words, in other words, the solution they came up with in all their creative genius gave rise to a global crisis that is still with us today, the Arab-Israeli conflict. <laughs> it's like, thanks a lot. It's a, it's a good try, but this is a pretty important story. Okay, we ready to read? How are we doing? Is this good? Let's read the first half of the chapter. <clears throat> now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And incidentally, I pointed out four weeks ago, when there was famine in the land of Canaan and Abraham went to Egypt and told Pharaoh, Sarah is my sister, he puts, him, puts her in his harem and then rewards him. One of the rewards he gave to Ab Abraham, Pharaoh gave to Abraham, was f women servants. So undoubtedly, Hagar came into his family through that previous mistake, one stake, one mistake often just digs your hole deeper. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. She's blaming the Lord on her condition, which is not entirely false, but she's, I think, got an attitude. <laughs> uh, Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. So she's telling her husband to go sleep with, I think, a young servant girl. That's, she's telling him to. Pretty interesting. I, I always, I often think if you were a movie producer, that would just be uh, interesting. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah which is the same thing it said back in Genesis 3, that Adam listened to the voice of his wife. We're going to come back to that. Um, so in other words, the text is underscoring the fact that Sarah is the one who came up with this bright idea. Abe basically says, whatever you say, dear. So after Abram had lived ten years, there's the ten years part, in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. It's very interesting how it says that. It's underscoring the fact that Sarah is Abraham's wife, not the concubine. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. I mean, it's like, boom, one, one time and she's pregnant. I mean, they, he and Sarah have been trying for about 60 years now to get pregnant. 
<laughs> and then he goes into Hagar and just, I'm pregnant. Um, these stories are so good. And, and when she saw that she had conceived, Hagar looked with contempt on her mistress. I think sort of sticking her tongue out saying, nah, 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 I got pregnant and you didn't, is sort of how at least I'm reading it. It's just competition. And Sarah says to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. In other words, this is your fault. <laughs> it's like, sort of, sort of. Uh, I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw and she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord's judge between you and me. And Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her whatever you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. <laughs> All right, let's make a few comments on that. And uh, I just called it Sarah's bright idea. Time is running out after seeing fertility specialists and undergoing hormone therapy. <laughs> Abraham, seven, 85, and Sarah, 75 decide to help God out. Incidentally, what age will Sarah be when she gives birth to Isaac? Ninety. Ninety. So they've been waiting ten years. They haven't even started waiting yet. They're going to wait fifteen more years. I mean, this is, when you think about and God wants to say, is saying, you said you believed. Chill. <laughs> Just chill. You said you believed. Ten years is a long time to wait. After all, God helps those who help themselves, right? One of these cliches that gets battered around in church sometime. Um, that's a deadly one. Number two. Though surrogate parenting may have been accepted by the culture, the text makes it clear that this was not God's plan for fulfilling His promise. Though Abraham was justified by faith last week, now he is walking in the flesh. Let's keep going. Number three, the text emphasizes the dysfunction that is painfully evident in the marriage of Abraham and Sarah. And uh, I am absolutely captivated by the dysfunctional families in Genesis and the, and the fact that the text doesn't hide it. it like, it's like, this looks like my marriage. This looks like how Katie and I interact sometimes. It's like it's... It's crazy, and it's here in the Bible, by Abraham. Okay, A, Sarah is manipulative, and she urges her husband to do something morally questionable. Just think about that for a moment. How many breakfast table conversations does a spouse urge a spouse to push, push the envelope? at Marley's in some area. It's one thing when the world, the flesh, and the devil are saying that. It's another thing it's when your spouse. Like what happened in the Garden of Eden, the woman is the origin of this sinful path. I could get in a lot of trouble right now if I say this wrong. <laughs> um, look at my footnote, though. Though Adam and Abraham should not have taken the advice of their wives. It's pretty clear, and the scripture underscores that. They, they were fools to listen to their wives. But Pilate should have listened to his wife, and so should Nabal. You know what the word Nabal means? Nabal means fool. Abigail's husband. And when Abigail meets David, he says, you have a husband. And she says, yeah, but he's a fool. 
and he was. But remember, Pilate's wife had a dream during the trial of Jesus, and she sent word to her husband, said, don't condemn that man. And I think Pilate said, go back to the kitchen. This is, this is big boy's work. You let us take handle the government. That's the decision I'm sure he regrets to this day. He should have listened. And, and Nabal died of a heart attack because he didn't listen to his wife's advice. Anyway, so it's a, I just put, the dynamics of the marital relationship and the origin of sin are truly deep and complex. All right, I don't know if you're getting as much out of that as I am, but... Uh, listen to how Paul says it. it back, I'm back up at letter A. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing. That's got to be one of the most interesting verses in the New Testament. Uh, Katie's worked on interpreting that for about 50 years, and. Uh, I wish you could hear her talk about it. If they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Um, I think I'd just encourage you as husband and wives, husbands and wives, to talk about where does deception come into our family. I'm not sure it's gender related, not always, but I do think males and females have different vulnerable spots or tend to. It's pretty interesting. And um, let me keep moving. <laughs> I love the way you're looking at me right now. You're just, um, let her be. So if Sarah is manipulative, and we can be pretty hard on Sarah, but the head of the family is the real problem here. Abraham is passive, the passive male just like Adam in the garden, the silence of Adam. I don't know if you remember, we had a whole section on the silence of Adam. Eve made her choice, but Adam is right there, the silent, emotionally detached male. Abram's got the same issue. Though the head of his house, he's failing miserably as a leader. He submits to his wife's leadership in both sleeping with Hagar and then remaining silent when Sarah abuses her, what we just read. As in the garden, the, silent, the husband is a silent wimp. <laughs> I just don't know another word to say it. And you see it as well as I do, but in, as a pastor, you just see it over and over and over. A manipulative woman and an emotionally detached, silent man who is not leading. And then he gets upset at his wife when she leads. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy cycle. As a, but you see it in Abraham and Sarah's marriage. Let her see. Notice how this episode, this is a biggie, is a mirror image of what had happened earlier in Egypt. In Egypt, Abraham had pushed Sarah to deny their marriage. Now think about what Sarah is living with since she left Egypt. When we went to Egypt, my husband told me to tell everybody that I'm his sister <laughs> to protect his own hide. This meant she was taken into Pharaoh's harem to be his sexual partner. Now, the text is not specific whether Pharaoh, vis Pharaoh visited Sarah or not, but it sort of leaves that up for grabs. So Sarah is living with this. My husband told me to deny my marriage. He put, my husband put me in Pharaoh's harem and now it's sort of her time to, okay, I'm going to respond in kind, sweetheart. Now, now Sarah is pushing Abraham to deny the meaning of marriage and commit quasi-adultery by sleeping with this Egyptian servant. It's tit for tat 
all's fair in love and war. <laughs> That's at least how I'm reading this. So dysfunction in the home. Number four, Sarah seems to be something of a bitter old woman. That may be too strong. She blames God for her barrenness and then blames Abraham for the chaos going on in their family. She's waited long enough. She seems to be controlled by the motto, don't just stand there, do something, anything. Go sleep with Hagar. I, I don't, I'd, I'd love to hear some of you just talk about your marriages right now. I, I, this just has flashbacks all over the map for me uh, about even my own marriage, just how we relate. So, so she is the origin of it. Letter number five, the moral of the story. Though Abraham and Sarah have a clear, unshakable knowledge of God's will, they both know God wants us to have children. God's will is that we will have children. They go about doing God's will in the wrong way. Oh, uh, yeah, let me back up to don't just stand, stand there, do something. Uh, look at the footnote. I have more fun on footnotes than in the text sometimes. And yet, the story will reveal that this is one of those situations when Sarah and Abraham should have been controlled by the motto, don't do anything, just sit there. The real challenge of faith is not what you do, it's what you don't do. And you trust God to do. That's hard. Um, so Sarah, uh, moral of the story, Abraham and Sarah have a clear, unshakable knowledge of God's will. They go about doing God's will in the wrong way. Note how, footnote, note how later in the Genesis story when Isaac's wife, Rebekah, is barren, what does he do? He prays for her and the Lord opens her womb. It's like, Abraham, why didn't you do that? Sarah, why didn't you ask Abraham to pray for you? All three of the wives of the patriarchs are barren. Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. They're all three barren. God opens their womb. It's pretty interesting. Uh, listen to this quote from Oswald Chambers. The fanatic, uh, written about this passage, the fanatical passionate desire to fulfill God's will, that is, God wants us to have children, Abraham. Do something. And we're fanatically passionate about that, leads them into desperate error. How many... Uh, I think the Crusades, you could say, were an attempt by basically Western Europe to do God's will man's way. It's, you can fall into desperate error. I think the Inquisition, at least historical examples, the Catholic Church said we've got to stamp out heresy. So let's burn people at the stake or something. It's like, you're fighting the right battle, but you're using the wrong weapons. And it's, you're making it worse than if you just did nothing. Um, stated in the New Testament terms, they are trying to do the will of God in the power of the flesh. I am... Um, They know God's will, but they're doing God's will in the wrong way. So this is a whole new set of issues. And if, okay, let's, letter B, let's read the second half of the chapter. I'm at verse 7, I'm reading to us. So, 
Hagar, I'm uh, pretty sure she's heading toward Egypt. She's, she's been run out of home. She's pregnant. Where is she going to go? I think she's heading across the desert to go back to Egypt. The angel of the Lord. First time in scripture that phrase occurs. And when the angel of the Lord first shows up, it's to an Egyptian woman. The mother of the Islamic nations. That's pretty remark. God loves Hagar. Very important. To, uh, and the text is clear. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? That's such a good question. She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. And I think Hagar said, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. Incidentally, that's the very same thing Paul said to Onesimus, the runaway slave who had become a Christian. Paul said, Onesimus, return to your master. It's like, really? Uh, verse 10, the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, which means God hears, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. Verse 12, he shall be what? A wild donkey of a man. I've entitled this study tonight, How to Birth a Donkey. This is the verse that I'm basting it on. His hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Beer Lahe Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. We doing okay? Um, I just let her be God's love for Hagar and Ishmael. This is the first mention of the angel of the Lord in the Bible. This may well be a pre-incarnate manifestation. You know what the incarnation is. That happened 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. But the second Jesus began his existence in Bethlehem, but not the second person of the Trinity. <laughs> the second person of the Trinity has always existed. There's always been three persons, one God. And many scholars think that this phrase, angel of the Lord, refers to the second person of the Trinity making a manifestation on earth. And he shows up at some pretty interesting places. It's a, read the commentaries on this. It's very interesting stuff. Um, running away to her home in Egypt, Hagar is told to go back to Sarah and submit. Though God is comforting Sarah, it is an example of tough love. The primary message and the key to the entire chapter seems to be found in three names. Hagar's son is named Ishmael, which means God hears. If Abraham and Sarah and even Hagar really believed that God hears, just chill. God's heard your prayer. He, he know, he's got this. The second name, Hagar, Hagar gives God a new name. I think Hagar 
may be the only person in the Bible, I think certainly in the Old Testament, who gave God a name. And she's a woman, and she's an Egyptian. And she has the audacity to name God. It's like, this is, this is, this is really amazing. And he, she names him El Roy, which means God sees. Not only does God hear, but God sees. And then the well where God meets her is named Bir Lahe Roy, which means the well of the one who sees me. And I think, yeah, let me just read what I wrote. These three names serve as a rebuke to the unbelief and impatience of Abraham, Sarah, and even Hagar. If they could have only remained strong in the confidence that God really does hear and see, they could have avoided all this mess. <laughs> I, uh, this is so convicting. Number three, it is shocking to hear God describe Hagar's son as a wild donkey. This is prophetic of the conflict that will come into the world between the families of Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac's going to be born 13 years later, but their descendants are the Jews and the Arabs. Okay. That's introduction. Here's our sermon. Ready? This is a... I love this. I love this sermon. How to birth a donkey. Um, I love preaching this message, especially in missionary retreats and to pastors, because um, most of us in ministry can look back in the rearview mirror and say, I've birthed a few donkeys. And uh, yeah, some of you are really smiling at me. This, uh, this story gives us an unforgettable picture of what happens whenever a child of God tries to accomplish the will of God. We're not talking about people trying to do bad things. We're talking about good people trying to do what they really believe God wants. And for Abraham and Sarah, they knew what God wants. He wants children. He's just not doing it, so we're going to help him. <laughs> that's, that's the story. By using human ingenuity, when a Christian tries to achieve a holy end by utilizing unholy means, the Crusades is, you know, it's an easy one. Let's go. I, or when the work of the Spirit is done in the power of the flesh, the result is always the birth of a donkey. So, here's my three-point sermon. It's a surefire, bona fide, money-back, guaranteed formula for birthing a donkey. <laughs> Diddy, don't laugh at me that way. Uh, this is just how my sick brain works. Uh, let me give you the outline because you'll, so you'll remember. Letter A, you can birth a donkey if you do God's work I'm going to use personal pronouns, my way. Letter B, if you do God's work in my time. And letter C, on the back, if you do God's work in my power. My way, my time, my resources. I know what God wants, but I'm going to do it my way, when I want to do it, and I'm going to use my resources. I promise you, you'll birth a donkey. And you'll regret it. And it will create <coughs> havoc. All right, let's talk about them briefly. And we can have the benediction. And I'm going to give you a little homework. First of all, do God's work my way. Abraham and Sarah came up with their own method for doing God's will. They did not realize that in God's kingdom, the means are just as important as the end. 
They assumed that if their plan was rational, practical, efficient, and culturally acceptable, it'd be fine. <coughs> but Jesus is the way. He's not just the destination. In doing God's work, it's not flashback. Building committee at Loudon, Loudonville Committee Church. Building a sanctuary. The goal is to build the building. It was so clear, and it was so God, it was right. But on the building committee, there was often a temptation, well, can we cut corners? Can we shave the price? Can we do things our way? Because we know what God wants. I don't know if that makes sense to you, um, but I'd love to hear some of your examples. Number two, let me tell you how I used to quote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. This is one of those verses I memorized, I don't, maybe in confirmation class, I don't know. But it, this is how I used to, I wouldn't quote it like this, but this is how I understood it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He will direct your path. And I was leaving out the part that I mumbled about, which I needed most to hear. And I've got it here in your notes. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and what? Don't lean on your own understanding, Stan. It's relatively easy for me to trust God, you know, and in all my ways acknowledge Him. But it is not easy to not lean, that's a double negative, on my own understanding, because I think I'm pretty smart. I think I know how to do things, just like Abraham and Sarah did. The Bible has a special term to describe those who believe in themselves and trust in their own knowledge. Fool, <laughs> book of Proverbs. Number three, we can imagine that the national anthem of hell will be Frank Sinatra's famous song, I Did It My Way. I wanted to ask somebody to sing special music tonight, and let's just... <laughs> that has got to be one of the most blasphemous songs. And I know some people have that sung at their funeral. I... Uh, I cannot, I won't name names, but I've, I heard, don't, no, I'm not going to say anything. But I, I can't imagine having that sung at your funeral and then step into the presence of God with that song in the background, standing before him. Um, and number four, 15 years later, when Sarah was 90, when she got pregnant, everybody knew God is the author of this story. The other big example uh, of this is David. You know, God anoints him king, and then for 10 years, he's hunted like a dog. And remember the moment when Saul comes in the cave to relieve himself, to cover his feet? is the King James meaning he drops his robe and sits on his royal throne in all his royal splendor. And David's men say, hey, kill him. God gave him into your hands. And David said, no, if I kill him, it'll mean I'm putting myself on the throne. This is God's business. I'm not touching him. And so when David got to the throne, all of Israel knew God wants him there. That's, and when Isaac is born, everybody knows that's the one. That's the one. Uh, God did it. So how do you birth a donkey? If you do it my way. Number two, you do it in my time. I don't know what it is for you, but in discerning the will of God, the timing in my life, experience is often 
as important as the deed itself. You get the timing wrong. Abraham and Sarah knew what God wanted, but they were not willing to wait for him to accomplish it in his timing. They had already waited 10 years, and they would have to wait another 15. That's a long time. But the alternative to waiting on the Lord is <laughs> birthing a donkey. Please don't birth another donkey. We've got enough running around. Number two, in the Bible, to wait on the Lord is a synonym for trusting or believing. Abraham and Sarah felt they had to do something. But the real test of faith lies in not doing. <coughs> they who what on the Lord shall renew their strength? Those who wait on the Lord. And some translations say those who hope in the Lord. But the word hope, the word wait, the word trust are really three ways of saying the same thing. And the second bullet, wait for the Lord. And some translations say, I think, trust or hope. To wait on the Lord is not a call to passivity, but it is a call to trust. We're almost done. Letter C, if you want to birth a donkey, do it my way, in my time, and in my power, or with my resources. Abraham and Sarah used their own human resources in their attempt to do the will of God. They succeeded. They got what they wanted. They, they wanted a baby. They got a baby. But they discovered they had birthed a donkey. They climbed the ladder to success only to discover that it was leaning against the wrong wall. <laughs> uh, somebody look up Psalm 106, verse 15. Somebody read it to us. This is just a... I think it was Bill Gothard, of all people, oh my goodness, that just dated me, wow. uh, who I heard quote this verse probably 45 years ago, and it just stuck with me ever since. Who, who's got Psalm 106, verse 15? He gave them their request, but sent lameness to their spirit. One more time. He gave them their request, but sent lameness to their soul. And he's talking about the people of Israel. They're praying for quail, all that we want meat to eat. And, God, and it says, he gave them, he answered their prayer. Be careful what you pray for. God may give it to you. But he sent leanness to their souls. Abraham and Sarah wanted a baby more than anything in the world. And they finally got it. But they had birthed a donkey. Once you start seeing this stuff in Scripture, it's on almost every page. Um, number two, when Peter took a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane and single-handedly attacked an entire Roman legion, and it could have been 600 professional soldiers. I mean, think of Peter basically with, I think, a knife he used to clean fish with. And he's just, let me at him, let me at him. He, he'll take on 600 professional soldiers. He was on the right team. He was zealous, and he was ready to die. But he was what? Using the wrong weapon. And Jesus just said, Pete, 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 put your sword away. You cannot do my work with weapons of flesh. You're on the right battle. And I appreciate your zeal, <laughs> but put your stupid sword away. And this is how Paul says it, 2 Corinthians 10, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. That's such a good verse. You cannot fight the Lord's battles using weapons of flesh. And uh, it happens every day. 
I love this quote of Hudson Taylor, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Conclusion. This is your homework. I'm going to have a short prayer, but you can take this home. I'll let you sort of, uh, but let me tell you what I just, rather than giving you some questions, this is how I've done it. Though Abraham was justified by faith, he was still walking in the flesh. He would never be the father that God had called him to be until he learned to walk in the spirit. Now here's the question for you and me. Is there an area where I am seeking to accomplish some work of the spirit in the power of the flesh? And I think my encouragement is just let the spirit answer that one if he takes you there. Is there an area where you're trying to do what you believe is God's will, but you're doing it in the power of the flesh, either my way, my time, my resources? And letter B is, is there an area in my life, a conflict, an unanswered prayer, a task to accomplish, a relationship where I have deep certainty about what God's will is, but I'm not certain my approach is right. I know what the result is supposed to be, but I'm not certain of the means I'm supposed to use to get there. Lord, what are you trying to tell me? Father, we thank you tonight for Abraham and Sarah and how much we feel we know this dear couple and how much we can identify with them. Thank you for how much you loved them and how much they loved you. Thank you for how human they are. And thank you for the tests of faith that eventually, over time, produced a man and a woman who we still talk about because they simply believed you. And when that happens, you count that as righteousness. Thank you for what they're modeling, and I pray that as we try to apply in our own stories and our own lives what we're learning, that your spirit would be quick to show us if there's some place in my life where I'm trying to do your work. In fact, I'm pretty sure I know what your work is but I'm using human resources, I'm using my timing, and I'm doing it my way. Lord, you speak to us about these things, and don't let us birth any more donkeys. We've got enough already. Have your way in our heart and dismiss us with your blessing. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' name and for the sake of the kingdom, amen.